my screen. Um, and so, um, yeah, my name is, is Chris Berg. I'm uh, an, uh, an American, uh, and I guess I'm what you would call a old data nerd. Um, and so I'm going to talk about something called data ops. Um, and so uh, why don't I tell about me first, and there's sort of two parts. One is I spent about, um, I spent about 15 years building software uh, at companies like a laboratory at MIT, uh, NASA Ames, some startups, Microsoft. And then um, I started building a lot of software and managed teams. And then about 2005, I got the idea that I should switch over into working on data. And so I'm going to tell you about what that was like for me and, and how that sort of became the genesis of, of um, what we're calling uh, a data ops. But first, um, I actually grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is in the center part of the United States. And my friends growing up had the last name of Ostrowski and Palzowitz. And so it turns out Milwaukee has a huge Polish population. Now, I am not Polish. I'm sort of German Norwegian. But I just thought you may find that interesting that the upper uh, Midwest of the United States is sort of full of, uh, <laughs> and Milwaukee actually has a Polish festival. It's America's largest Polish festival every summer. So um, just as, as a background, so. Um, That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually one of my my, my friend, Steve Palzowitz in, in uh, college, he was often talking about Polish, the greatness of Polish mathematicians. Um, and so that's one of the things I remember about him. So anyway, Milwaukee's got a big Polish population. Um, and so, so why don't I start to talk about my life as a, as a data team leader? So, um, you know, it was 2005, I had young kids. I thought, oh, I'm, I'm a really great software guy. I know all about software. So I'm going to do this data thing and it'll be really easy. And it turns out it wasn't very easy at all. So I, I worked for a company that provided data and analytics to the US healthcare industry. And if you know anything about the US healthcare industry, it's a mess. It's, and for, it's a mess in a lot of ways um, from it's very expensive, it has, um, it's poorly distributed. And from a data perspective, it's also an incredible mess. And so we were providing, I worked for a company that provided analytics to healthcare companies. And so I had what we now call data engineers and data scientists and people doing BI who worked for me. And, you know, things were breaking all the time and I'd have to sort of leave my kids, um, uh, so what we, you know, soccer game to go off and fix it or find some problems. And, you know, I, as I had the role of a chief operating officer. And so I was the person that people called when things went wrong. And I just grew to sort of hate having a head of a sales force, a 5,000 person sales force call me up and saying, Hey, Chris, the data's wrong. Um, you know, you moron, uh, if you don't get it, we're going to kick you out. And that was like, those are not sort of fun calls. Um, and you know, the other part too, is I had a lot of people who were really trying hard. They were working very hard. They were really trying to make their customers satisfied, but they do things like, you know, my customer asked for something it's Friday afternoon. I put the change in. I'm not entirely sure it worked, but you know what? It's been a week and they haven't called me, <laughs> called me up and yelled at me. So I guess it's good. And, uh, you know, he, he thinks he's doing the right thing. Um, and then every day I started to hate going into work because I had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that something was going to go wrong, um, that the data was wrong, the reports would be bad, uh, we wouldn't get stuff done. And I, I just really sort of started to hate my job, honestly. Um, and, and partly it was because there are so many different data providers and, and part of the healthcare industry in the US, there's um, data from inside companies, data from outside companies, and we were integrating several hundred different data sets. And the data providers would often just change the data randomly and drop columns and add columns. And it was sort of uh, very rough. Um, and then I, I, the, the guy who founded the company was a physician, and, and he was very good at understanding US healthcare and, and how to analyze it, but not a very good technical person. And, so he would go off and think of a new data idea and I would sit down with a data scientist and a data engineer and we'd figure out how to do it and say, hey, it's going to take two weeks. And my boss would look at me like I'd killed a patient on the table and said, Chris, that's going to take two weeks. I thought that should take two hours. And so my life was just, you know, hard and, you know, I hired a bunch of smart people. They all wanted to use their own tools. And finally, 
I've been married now for almost 30 years and I complained to my wife so much that she's like, I can't stand it anymore. Could you either fix it or shut up about it? And so <laughs> in some ways, uh, the co-founders of I, we've really spent the last 15, I guess now 17 years working on, on this solution. Um, and so what we do is we, uh, and uh, what's interesting is this sort of pain that I bring up in, in, in jobs and work um, that I experienced, we did a survey that's actually a statistically interesting survey is sort of six or 700. It was primarily data engineers, but there were some other roles in it. And a lot of them just were, were very unhappy. You know, 79% considered switching careers, 70% expect to change jobs, 78% uh, want a therapist. 52% um, just hope things won't break. And I was honestly not surprised at that. I'm, I'm disappointed that this is the state of the world, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very difficult job. And, and it very, that reflects, uh, and not much has changed about it in, in 15 years. And so um, what I'm gonna talk about uh, in this, and that sort of background of who I am and the emotional context of, of why we started this company and, and the change that we're trying to make in the world, I'm going to kind of set the concept of um, what data ops is as an idea um, and how it applies to data and analytic systems, um, how it's been used at some of our customers, and, and kind of go from there. Um, so how, how does that sound? Is it good so far? Is my, uh, am I speaking too fast, too slow? How's it, how's it coming across? Yeah, for me, it's well. It's perfect. Okay. So one of the things is that uh, as a data engineer or a data scientist, we go into work and we're very focused on, my, on the next data task. Like, how do I change my Python code? How do I change some SQL? How do I tweak Tableau? Um, I'm, you know, what's my new data set? We're very focused on the task of doing data uh, in that river of work that's right in front of us. And so what is good and what is done in data and analytics means that I've completed those tasks. And I'm suggesting that that task focus is really the cause of the fact that not only are people unhappy, but most data and analytic projects fail in some port. That they're late, they don't work. Um, we've all heard about data warehouse and data lake and models not getting into production. Um, and so, what I'm suggesting, and, and the whole point of this is to think upstream. So don't think about the task you have to do. Think about how the system that that ta task works in, how you develop, how you iterate, how you deploy and monitor and test the stuff next to the work that you're doing. And that system that you work in um, is really important how you and how you automate it. And if you put time into that, the whole argument of data ops is you're thinking that you should spend time on the data task. And that's true, but you should spend a bunch of time here on automating and testing and monitoring and checking. And if you do, you're actually gonna get more done. And that's the whole point. And so we've been sort of living these ideas for years and we started the company now eight years ago and um, we've always been a, a profitable company. Um, and you know we've sort of grown a fairly quickly now. And, and so one of the things that because being a profitable company and technical founders, we all did technical work starting the, the company. So I wrote the product, I was a data engineer, my co-founders were did the similar thing. And so when we finally got the product to a point where we felt we could sell it, um, we knew that we needed to name this word. And there were lots of words out there. There were sort of DevOps for data science, agile analytic operations um there's just uh, and so we settled on the term data ops um and we went to a conference and people sort of no one had any idea what we were talking about so get this we're um three sort of middle-aged guys in a company called data kitchen so we wore chef's jackets and chef's hats and gave out wooden spoons and at the conference about 20 percent of the people looked at us like we were complete morons um, which was, you know, hurt our fragile egos, but it, it was a good lesson in the sense that we had to kind of write down what we mean by data ops. And so we wrote something called the data ops manifesto. Um, we've sort of talked about what it means and, and, and we've written now two books and, and done a lot of content and, and partly it, it comes from these ideas of its intellectual heritage is 
the same thing that comes from building great cars or building great softwares, um, agile, lean manufacturing, DevOps. And it's really about the cycle time at which you can change something in production. It's really about running things with low errors. It's really about increasing the speed at which you can work with people and then sort of measuring and observing um, the, the systems that you that you are creating and the tasks that you're doing. And so, it, but in another way, it's really sort of redefining what it means to be good and done. And, uh, and so for um, a simple way to think of data ops is what's good is it's in your customer's hands and delivering value. That's what good and done means. And it doesn't mean that it works on your machine. It doesn't mean that it's sitting in a CI and CD pipeline. It's in production, it's making value uh, and your customer is using it. And so that sort of uh, is a sort of a concept beginning of what data ops is. Um, any questions before I go on? And now I'm gonna get a little bit more kind of examples and a little bit more details, um, but those are the sort of emotional and kind of um, theoretical concepts of what data ops is. Um, actually, I would have one question. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, um, so, so um, you were one of the persons that uh, created Data Ops Manifesto. Yeah, yeah. I wrote the Data Ops Manifesto. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, well, there's a few I, I, other people who contributed it, but yeah. I mean, I, 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 I mean, it wasn't hard. I took that the Agile Manifesto and then some <laughs> other stuff. And I sort of like took like a deck of cards and weaved it together and then edited it. It was it actually it's it sort of wrote itself. My co-founders yeah. and I had 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 given these topics before and rewrote the agile manifesto and then after that conference where no one understood what we mean we, we on the flight back we sort of started to write the uh the manifesto and tossed it back and forth and some other people helped too but yeah yep amazing yeah it's, and it's incredible that that let's have sort of 20 30 000 signatures we've had we've given away now 20 30 000 books um and so the idea itself has really gained gained a lot of traction and, and it's um it's uh I'm I'm happy about that because for many years I sort of felt like I was standing beside the road and, and cars were flying by and no one was listening to me um saying you know this stuff's important and uh so I, it's nice to see it still has a long way to go um because a lot of people are very focused on you know what's my next model what's my next sequel I gotta write and not thinking about systems and, and tools around their work, but um, it, it's getting there. And, and yeah, so I think, you know, uh, um, okay, is there another question? Um, no, I don't see anything for now. Yeah, and so, um, you know, I think one, one way to think of it is there's there are data people, right? And, and there are different roles, data engineers, data scientists, people who do BI and self-service, data governance, and in general, like the business customers who receive the value are unhappy. And um, survey after survey says the people who are, they, they don't feel their data analytic teams are getting, are giving them enough insight. The number of companies that are reported as being data-driven is actually declining. Um, and so even after all this spend and infrastructure. And so, um, you know, and, and I think one of the challenges is that the, the work is different and there's different tools that people need to be able to work together. And so if you look at a very basic case where some data engineers source and build a database table and a data scientist applies a model to it in some ways and the BI team goes in and, and visualizes it, right? And maybe mixes in some data with a tool like Alteryx and then the data governance team tries to figure out where it comes from. All these teams are working on the same Think of it as a value stream or a pipeline or, uh, you know, and the customer says, I don't understand, or this doesn't look right. Um, you know, they, they have to go back and look at all the different tools that they work for. So for instance, you may, um, you know, you may be using Kubeflow with Python, right? Running in a Kubernetes cluster with data that's located in Azure um, data lake. And then it may go into Synapse or Snowflake, and then you may have some Python models that run on top. Um, and then you may have a, a, a dashboard in, in Alteryx, or you may have a streaming system that goes in and, and then it, it, another database on top. But there's lots of tools to visualize data, 
do data science on data, do catalogs and governance and do ETL or data transformation. There's lots of databases and there's an insane amount of data. And, and there's like 50 tools for every job, right? And, and I, I guess I've come to believe that those tools are, are great, but um, it's just a tool. And, and I've learned that people love their tools and I don't ever want to have an R versus Python conversation or Tableau versus Looker or, you know, Matillion versus Informatica versus DBT argument in my life. I mean, it's they're good tools, all of them, but it's not about the tool. It's about the system the tools work in. And, and so partly one attribute of that system is to think of what you do as a factory. And so, um, in auto manufacturing, sort of raw materials come in and you assemble a final product along an assembly line. And I think that actually is really true in data and analytics. They're, the workstations at which we work aren't people standing, they're sort of code-driven tools like tools to load data, tools to, you know, um, to transform data, run models on data, visualize, govern. And, you know, those are the workstations and at the end, it may be data is uh, ingested, it's transformed, it's integrated, things are added on top of the data and your data customer will see the dashboard, the catalog, the result of the model They may be embedded in some other complete system that they don't even know, but they'll be very quickly be able to tell if it's wrong. And so you wanna have a factory that produces good things. Um, when I grew up in the Midwest, in the United States in the 1970s and 80s, there were car manufacturers who produced terrible cars. Um, and one of the reasons they produced terrible cars is that they didn't focus on the process of manufacturing. And my father was a telephone repairman and we drove a Toyota, um, uh, which his union buddies would yell at him for because it's not an American car. But my dad said, look, it's cheaper and it lasts longer. So why would I bother, um, you know, why would I buy an American car? And so in a lot of ways, our manufacturing lines and data and analytics now are producing sort of crappy American cars from the 1970s instead of sort of BMWs and Toyotas. And so there is this idea of you run an assembly line. It doesn't really, the assembly line here doesn't matter if it's big data or small data or structured or unstructured or streaming or batch. Um, it, it's the same uh, perspective. And unfortunately, these assembly lines themselves are not in one place. So a lot of larger organizations, the teams that do the work are broken up by function. So you'll have maybe an IT team or a data team. You'll have a data science team. You'll have lines of business or self-service teams around the organization. And there's this rule called Conway's Law that says, you know, the, the divisions in a technical product are not because of the inherent um, the inherent qualities of that technical product, they're because of the way the company designed the organization. And I think that's that's true here. And so that complexity, that organizational complexity also drives low productivity. And, and you know, companies just have lots of pipelines everywhere, right? Um, they're batch and streaming and manual, and they're oftentimes, you know, it organizationally bound or some are shared across organizations and there's lots of, of ownership of them. And there's another type of pipeline in the organization, which is the way in which you get things into production. And so one is the operational pipeline, you know, your manufacturing line. But think of perpendicular to that um, is the deployment or uh, uh, how you get a change to some SQL code or a Python model into production. And, and so how do you do that in an iterative way? And unfortunately, there is no consensus now on exactly how we get things into production. Oftentimes companies will have multiple environments, a dev, a QA, UAT. There's multiple deployment techniques. There's manual, some companies are adopting CI and CD. There's more of a, a functional continuous, um, which is my favorite sort of continuous variation, AB testing model. And um, you know, multiple teams, oftentimes companies will have several different methods to get things into production. You know, the self-service team will press a button. Um, maybe the uh, data loading team will have a very, have six environments and it'll take a while. And maybe this data, this data engineering team will have two environments. And so these paths to production are, are, are many. And so the challenge here is that um, you, you, we're running a factory. You wanna produce really good results. However, you need to change that factory very quickly because 
in order for you to deliver value to your customer, um, the cycle time at which you can respond to what they do, how fast you can actually get new ideas from your brain into production is a huge determinant of success. And so the faster you can deploy with less risk, um, and if you can do that in smaller pieces, you actually get more value. And that's sort of the one of the fundamental ideas of Agile is that, um, you know, try to um, get smaller pieces into the hands of your customer quicker and learn, and then you maximize the amount of work that you don't have to do. So you have to run a factory, you've got to change it fast, you've got to work with an organization that is all over the place. And lastly, you, you, you should be able to measure and observe these systems as they're running, because I think those are a, a good source of learning. And so you've got this very complicated world. Um, and that's one of the challenges is because it's complicated. And then even technically it's complicated, right? It's a distributed system, there's multiple servers, um, you know, cloud versus on-prem, uh, et cetera. And so well, let's look at a couple of examples from customers. And but before I jump into the section, is there any kind of comments or questions on that? Yep, there is one. Okay. Uh, let me see. Oh, um, what what is it? I, I, you know, my um, I gotta go and. Um, I, I think I think attendees should be able to unmute themselves. Oh, okay. So, Martin, if you want. No, I just don't see it. Okay. Well, feel free to ask the question. So, yeah, it should come at some point eventually. So, okay. So let's look at these. So, these three things: your customer who's on a dashboard or looking at a data set in a database or looking at something that's embedded in a website. Say the data's wrong, um, or they ask you to do 10 things and you say, I'll get it to you in a month. And they say, your team's just too slow. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do it myself or they roll their eyes at you. And then the third is like, they ask you what your team's doing and can you measure it? And so, you know, if we look at it from a, a, a people perspective, like you could say, there's Eric, there, there's think of data ops as a concept, but think of it in terms of what happens in production, what happens in development and how you measure. And so um, I'm gonna talk about that in, in, in three ways. So let's just say Eric is your production engineer. And um, you know Eric is a, kind of a production perfectionist. So maybe you run day in and day out production yourself. Maybe you throw it over the wall to some team who runs it. But in general, you when you have something that works, the data is changing and you wanna know if something's wrong. Like did, they, did we not receive data? Did the data change suddenly? Um, is the data different than what I expected? Um, it, did the server not work? And so how do you sort of protect and perfect the sort of daily grind of delivering data? How do you minimize errors and chaos and, and kind of get a single pane of glass and sort of know what's wrong as soon as possible? And so like if you look at uh, like an example, so let's say you're running an airflow job that's got a 1 a.m. batch schedule you have a cron job that runs a Jupyter notebook and then somebody's got to push a button on this Tableau dashboard. And like, this is not actually uncommon in a lot of companies, um, big or small to have these kind of disjoint processes. And so, you know, Eric's job is to make sure all this works, right? Did it run? Is it late? Um, are the reports still showing the right data? Is the model showing the right thing? Is it predicting right? Because basically Eric and his team are the ones who are going to get yelled at when the business customer says this is, you know, they're the first when it's wrong or, hey, my dashboard's not right. And so, um, you know, it, it gets complicated, right? Because like, here's an example um, of a telematics process. Now, what telematics means is in the U.S., um, you have auto insurance. And if you give up your personal privacy, i.e. you put a box in your car that shares your latitude and longitude and velocity at any point in time, you can get a discount on your auto insurance. And so it checks to see like if you're accelerating too fast or braking. Um, and this company built a really cool system. Um, it's actually streams uh, using Kafka as an event bus, uses S3 as kind of a 
sort of a multi-layered data lake and does some work in Databricks, has some scoring models, uses Snowflake, interacts with a policy system and ends up in these applications. So they spent 18 months, two years building this whole system. They started to you know, pour the data in and the data customers were like, hey, this doesn't make sense. I just drove, um, a, you know, I just took a drive and it's not there. Or you're showing me that I could drive at a thousand miles an hour um, and that's too, you know, too fast. Um, and so when they had these problems, the work that they did was kind of in different pieces. And so what happened is the teams ended up blaming each other for the problem. It's your fault. It's your fault. Um, and so the, it took them a long time to figure it out. And, and um, you know, I've seen examples of other companies where like it's I just talked with the one of the top 20 companies in the United States and he had 26 of his people search down a data error because the CEO of one of the top 20 companies in the United States called up this head of the data team saying, hey, this report's blank, you moron. <laughs> and and he had, so imagine like you're working and the CEO says your report's blank and you have to spend all day digging it out. And it was like some dumb error somewhere that made the report blank. And 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 so it ends up, you know, it, it ends up taking time. It's a bit discouraging. Um, and why can't we find these things out ahead of time? Like, why can't we know as the system is running um, that it works? And so, you know, what we did is we sort of built a system on top of that, right? That sort of sits on the queue and observes. And it really, it's not so much to, um, you know, if you look at it from like a, a theory standpoint, we're trying to observe the system, but the system can't tell you if it's right. You have to dig into the system in the data to prove that it's right because it's a code governed, data governed system. And so you need to actually check the data or check the things that are being created from the data. You have to check the result of the scoring model. You have to check the uh, integrated data, not just the raw data to see if it makes sense because sometimes errors don't show up until you've actually put the data together. And in this case, they, they wanted it to be take place in their sort of like 60 second cycle time to have data flow through and, and then quarantine data. And so kind of from a principle standpoint um, is that when you have a data system and it's not just a database, right? Not just a data warehouse, it's the data warehouse because the principles of data ops is think of it from your customer's perspective. So follow that journey that data takes all the way to when your customers get a hold of it and test it automatically in production, uh, kind of on top of your entire tool chain. And if you find a problem, alert someone right away um, and then keep track of the history of what's going on. Um, and then I think of there's a, a set of ways to understand how to check data. And so some of them have to do with taking the rawest level of data and what's called profiling it, saying, okay, here's this table, this table's got a column, this column's got three values. So make sure that if you get a fourth value, maybe you should have an alert to people because that could be mean it's wrong or if you only have two values when you're expecting three. Um, another type of chest test really comes from manufacturing, looking at what's called statistical process control. So if you are constantly getting 10,000 rows from a data provider, but all of a sudden you get 100,000. Well, that could mean an anomaly, that could mean an error. Um, it's most important that you know before your customer sees it that something's wrong. Um, and then in a lot of these systems, data goes from one database or one representation to another. Um, and so kind of on top of your system, decorate it with tests that actually look at data, look at integrated data, look at models look at visualizations to see if they're right and, and kind of think of it through their customer lens and um so i, I began my career in, in 1990 and i worked at nasa ames and so at that time i don't know if you know the hubble space telescope um which uh was just put into orbit and it didn't work it was blurry <laughs> and so which was a big embarrassment for nasa they had to spend like 100 million dollars kind of basically sending corrective lenses up to the Hubble telescope. And so why is that? They just never, no one ever on the ground, like looked through the Hubble telescope to see if it actually worked. And so I, I think in my mind, I think of the same thing here. Look through, you're building a data system, look at it with the eyes of your customer and build automated tests to check. And what that means is you're driving less errors, you're finding um, problems sooner, 
that means your customers are going to trust the data, the reports, and you're going to get more time for innovation. So by driving errors down, you actually get more work. Um, and so you're building this sort of observational system on top. And you're trying to, what I found is if you do that, you actually get less stress and embarrassment um, and people end up actually enjoying their work more and they fe feel more free to make changes to things. Um, and so that, that's the first part is, is really, um, um, you know, don't change your tools, but build a system on top of your system that observes and monitors and checks it in production. Um, and then, um, you know, what, um, and, you know, unfortunately, we found that that and like my example, we've done surveys that people are spending and Gartner has said people are spending too much time on errors. And so just another concept idea is um, people talk about data quality. And so data quality is sort of a measurement of the state of the raw data. Is it complete? Is it unique? Is it timely? Is it valid? There's sort of a group called DEMA um, that has a measurements of data quality and lots of books. And I, I think it's not just about data quality because you could have bad, you could have perfect data, but a bad system that operates on it, poor code, a server went down and it's wrong, it's an error. You could have imperfect data, but a perfect system that operates on it, it's still an error. Um, or you could have both and you could have a hardware problem that it's just slow. You get a perfect data and a perfect process that acts upon it on imperfect hardware. Um, and so all those things are errors to your customers. Um, and so you need to check all those. Is it late? Um, is it slow? Is the data right? Is the report right? And so um, the second part is to think of data ops, not from what happens in the production process, but what happens in the development process. And so um, um, let me kind of keep going here. So um, how do you actually get things into production? And so from that, that uh, points, I'm going to talk about a guy named Ahmed, who's kind of the deployment director. And um, how do you actually get things into production when you um, move things? And there's a technique from uh, software called CI and CD, continuous integration deployment, which basically means don't manually take code or configuration from your development environment and put it into a uh, production. You know, don't use Word documents and to describe how to do it, but actually automate it. And so I think that's really important to do. However, it's not enough. You need to not only be able to move things automatically, but you also need to kind of regression and functional test your data and analytic systems. And so what that means is how do you actually go in and um, prove that a system works? So let's say I have something that's in production. It's a database and a model and a report. I've made a change to the database and maybe made a change to the report and I tweak the model. And so I, what I wanna do is take data from production, maybe a copy of production data or a smaller GDPR compliant subset. And I wanna run it through a development system end to end to see if it works. Because that's the only way you can actually prove that you don't have, and you don't have some impact on uh, a part of the system. And so what it, that's sort of a definition of what regression or functional and end-to-end -end testing means in the data and analytics world. Take data that is like production data, exact, but maybe exact, but not necessarily. Take a copy of production as close as you can do it and run those together. And so um, the most important thing is that you're trying to judge impact. And so um, now I'm, I have a son who's uh, 22 years old, he just got a job as a software engineer at Amazon. And so I love my son, um, but you know, for most of his life, his bedroom was uh, a complete mess covered in Legos and things that he was taking apart. He had a typical engineer's childhood. And so um, within two weeks of joining Amazon, he deployed code to production. And so I was surprised at that because as much as I love my son, I'm not sure I would let him uh, deploy code to production. Well, why did they do that? Well, because it's not that, my son is a genius, uh, it's that they built a system around my 22 year old son. So if he could make a very small change, that the impact of that change on the greater system could be measured and tested automatically before it got into production. And I think we need to do that with um, data and analytic systems. And so, um, and so I think really focus uh, from a best practices standpoint on um, being able to uh, run your tests in production 
And I think another idea is that sort of code-based unit tests are not enough, they're nice, but you need to actually test data to test your code in development. And you, uh, I think you should reuse a lot of those production tests as regression and functional tests in, in development. And um, so why do this? Well, regression error and rework is a pain. Uh, it slows you down. Uh, faster deployment and less risky deployment means you can deliver smaller things faster, which means you're more likely to do uh, get what your customers really want. And that's the one of the biggest challenges I've seen in data and analytics is actually knowing what your customers want. Um, and um, you know you, we have to push back on the tendency to say, I'm going to go spend three months and build the most amazing thing um, and then put it in your customer's hands and they go, no, nah, that's not what I wanted. Um, and you just sort of wasted several months of work. And, and then lastly, um, uh, this idea of measurement and, and observations and talk about like Stephanie as a team leader. So it, it's actually not just Stephanie, there's lots of people who wanna understand sort of what's going on in data and analytics and want the sort of measurement of all these systems and pipelines. And think of it, the production operation team, uh, an individual data engineer, a team leader, and, and even the data customer wants to know. And, and what the challenge here is they don't have a shared context to talk about sort of what's happening with the production of the data. And so can you get, um, uh, and DMC here means sort of data ops mission control, provide a shared context of every pipeline in the organization from source to customer value across every tool environment and data and analytic team organization. So can people see the same thing? And one of the challenges of, of this is that sort of IT monitoring, like server and CPU cycle monitoring is good, but it's not enough, right? Because to prove that something works in data, you need to check the data, the integrated data, or the things that are created from the data. It's not just to say that my server ran or my process didn't rip, um, give a signal that it, it had an error. Um, I mean, those things are less, uh, I found that those are more about being able to diagnose problems than actually in indicative of problems. Like if your job is running late, that could be because your disk is running out of space or your CPU is pinned, or it could mean that someone has put in a chunking weird SQL that slowed things down. And so um, I don't think the sort of application performance monitoring is quite enough. You actually, and, and sort of why is that? Well, if I look at um, kind of systems that um, uh, people develop nowadays, you, and you sort of follow the journey, right, of data that goes from an FTP into S3 buckets, into database tables, into a Python model, into an extract in Tableau, and then in pushed into Tableau server, you may have to, you know, you have five tran and DBT and SQL and Jupyter and Tableau, you sort of have five, six tools operating on it. And then you may have, like we showed before, cron scripts, and there's no way to sort of see this across all the companies as sort of what we're calling awkwardly the sort of observational meta pipeline. And these meta pipelines have relationships to each other, they have relationships in the organization. And so um, in a lot of ways, you need to kind of take what's working and kind of abstract it up a level because there's this complicated world of what's going on in your organization. And it may be that something happened in the database or maybe the model's not predicting um, or maybe the cron is late. Um, and so you need to help people kind of synthesize all this thing together and you need to help them group it together so they can make sense of it. Um, and all those people can, can make that happen. And so one of the things that we're building is a way to kind of synthesize all that information for every pipeline in the company across every tool um, in one place. Um, and we're calling it a, a mission control to bring it all together. And, and we're building this concept of a sort of a meta pipeline that everyone can register their information. It doesn't replace your, your operational pipeline. It doesn't replace Airflow. It sits on top of Airflow and sits on top of all the other things and allows you to sort of um, group that together in a coherent view and then drill down and alert and et cetera. And so we, one of the reasons that we've done this is we've um, built these kind of reports in our, in our product for years. And one of this is one of my favorite reports that kind of shows kind of the idea of uh, data ops in one view. And so if you look at, think of this as a project dashboard and looking at one project dashboard here, you can see over time um, the middle part has a bar chart and the bar chart has red blocks, which show the number of serious errors. 
and the number of serious errors are going down. And consequently, the time, the amount of times they're late and miss their S SLA has decreased to none. And also the number of deploys from one environment to the other has gone up. And why is that? Well, really because their number of the amount of tasks and automation that they've built has, has increased. And so there's this relationship between um, you know, the velocity of deployment and lowering errors and the amount of automation and automated testing that you do that um, these metrics can help drive. And so um, let's see, how much time do we have? So we've got, how, how am I doing on time? Should I, um, I, I've got probably five or 10 more minutes to talk. Should I do that or should we break? Yeah, and, and yeah definitely, finish? definitely, go on. Okay. Um, so any questions before I go on to the next section? All right, so let's talk about the the idea of a data ops engineer and think of it both as a person and a set of tasks, right? And I think what I think of a data ops engineer is the person that owns the assembly line. They don't own a workstation. They don't run a particular workstation on the assembly line, but they own the assembly line. And they so they own the pipelines that run the assembly process. They work on the pipeline, but not in the pipeline. And, you know, I think data op, the idea of a data ops engineer is someone who sits between roles. And this is sort of stolen directly from a DevOps engineer, right? Because DevOps engineers work with front end engineers, back end engineers, uh, DBAs, they work with production operations. And it's the same thing. Data ops engineers sort of works between it. And one of the challenges uh, and one of the reasons why you may need to help do data ops is that, you know, people's maybe taking things like i'm a data engineer i just wrote some um you know i just did an informatica job and i'm just going to throw it over in a production um and people sort of have a differing definition of what done is what what's done and what's good uh, there's a lot of sort of blindness or people focusing on their only part of the problem and one of the tensions is a data ops engineer is trying to take and allow people to build uh, allow people to see the impact of what they do see, I give them a view from their local to the global that they work in. And so another way to say is that the people who do work, I'm a data engineer, a data scientist, I create nuggets. And what do I mean by nuggets? Think of nuggets as code, SQL, ETL, Python, XML code. And what a data, what a data ops engineer is puts those into a bigger context, a pipeline with automated tasks that runs the factory, that does deployment, and it becomes this shared abstraction across people. And it allows people to see if things work. And in some ways, data ops engineering is about taking things that we see invisible, that, that are invisible and making them visible. And so you may, as a data engineer or a data scientist, be working on your model or SQL code. And how this fits into the bigger picture is hard. And so a role of a data ops engineer is to help make that apparent to the individual contributors so that when they make a change they can see the impact and, and be notified and when it runs in production if it doesn't work they can be notified and so it is taking what's visible and making it what is invisible and making it visible and and so i think one of the biggest challenges with data ops engineering is that very similar to the role of a devops engineer is it's seen as work for lesser beings or you do it on friday afternoon um, or there's a perception that data is different. And so when I ran software teams in 1999, uh, we had a SaaS product. So we um, uh, ran it in our, we had a bunch of servers in our closet. Um, and we had an engineer, uh, a release engineer who was in charge of it. And there were sort of the software team I ran had 35 people and there was one release engineer and his he was paid um, significantly less than everyone else on the team. Um, and so what we thought was good is like we released it and then we just gave him the code and said, okay, it, it's your, you know, we sort of threw it over to him and he had to figure out what to do. And he had a hard time, right? He was fun at parties and he played the mandolin, um, but you play that forward. And now you look at a typical software team. Some statistics say 28% um, of the team is involved in DevOps activities. So, and those DevOps activities aren't actually doing new javascript new back-end code new front-end code they're building the system to make that more efficient and run better and so um 
and honestly, DevOps engineers are more expensive than um, a really good DevOps engineer. Is it, it, it costs more um, at, from a, a salary standpoint than a typical back end or front end engineer. And I think the world's changed in that building this system around your work is seen as not work for lesser beings, but actually really uh, cool work that needs to be done. And um, there's been a bunch of investment and tools and paradigm changes that have gone. And I think we're starting that journey with data and analytics. Um, and so one of the roles of a data ops engineer is to sort of be an advocate for this and say, look, this happened in software, it's gonna happen here and you need to, um, you know, you need to work on deployment and monitoring and observation and source code control and version control and 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 testing and all these things are really important for us, our success. And, and they're not just my job, they're everyone's job. And so, I mean, it just really comes down to automation, right? It's, it's just about automating things, automating production orchestration and monitoring and testing and environments and functional testing and deployment automation and shared components and measurement. There's just, it's really is an automation task. It's not doing the work, it's automating around the work. Um, and so I'm, I'm a big believer in this role. I think, um, you know, is it 28% of every data and analytic team? Well, I'd be happy with 10% because right now I think it's like 1%, <laughs> honestly. Uh, and so I think, you know, if we could get to 15% of the team working on data ops and you know, 23, 23% in DevOps, that's fine. Um, but uh, it, it does require sort of a thinking in your organization and also sort of raising up those activities and saying they're worthy of investment. And also that people should own it. Like you shouldn't write, you, you I, I think, um, you know, as much as shame is not a great emotion, if I'm a software engineer, at least in my company, if you're a software engineer and you break the build because you put some code in and your test didn't cover it, all the other software engineers are going to look at you and kind of go, oh, they're going to give you, you know, they're, they're, they're nice people, but they're not going to yell at you. But, you know, there's a little shame involved. And I think that's the same thing. If you're going to go change your, if you change some data code and it breaks in production, that's not acceptable, right? You know, you as a person screwed up um, and we should be able to figure out how to, and, and it's not the person's fault. It's actually the manager's fault for not building a system that allowed that person to make successful. And that's one of the key things I've learned um, in the years is back in 2005, when everything I was running my first data and analytic teams and things were breaking, um, I thought the best thing, one of the sources I could find people to fire, I would like find people to blame. And that's like a terrible way to lead an organization. And I started to read, um, this guy called Deming, who, uh, is about, you know, uh, total quality management and, um, the Toyota production system. And he basically said that, in any large complicated system, 94 or 97% of the time, the problem is in the system and not in the person working in the system. And, you know, if you believe that, then that's actually really hard to be a leader because what do you own as a leader? Well, you own the system. And if people are screwing up, it's not because they are personally, you know, only 3% of the time it's, it's because they've, they are, they're not worthy. You just haven't built a system or a process around those teams to make them successful. And that applies to factories, it applies to software, and it applies to data and analytic systems. And so um, one of the things lastly that we do is we help, um, you know, we have a software product, um, does a lot of things with data ops, and we also help uh, uh, bigger companies kind of do data ops transformation. Um, but before I finish, um, I just want to leave you with this thought, right? Is that if you look at the world today, and think of it as a graphic equalizer on your stereo and say a lot of organizations are taking weeks or months to get new things into production from development. And when they do run, they are um, encountering errors in production all the time. Some of them they don't even know about, but, um, and they're spending a lot of times in meetings and documentation. And for being data and analytic teams, they don't have very many measurements of how things are going. And so the idea is that um, the, the result of these is that it's very slow and costly to do work. And as we saw, a lot of people who work in data and analytics are unhappy, including customers. And so the real concept of data ops is this, is that you can take that graphic equalizer and you can push all those up at the same time. 
you can deliver faster and do it with less errors and spend less time in meetings and measure things so you can look good to your boss. And um, I think that's the, um, if you've been in the data and analytic field for a while, this is a, a slide that um, gives you heartburn um, because a lot of people who've been in the field for a while say, you make me deploy faster, that means more errors, that means I'm gonna get yelled at more. And, and what data ops says is no, build automation or, and, and testing around your system and you can deploy faster and you can have less errors. And um, if you do that, you're actually going to be much more productive. And what we've seen with our software is that literally a factor of 10 increase in productivity. Um, because what they're doing is they're iterating quicker, doing things in smaller cycles, developing automation, and therefore their customers are just much happier. Um, and so just to conclude, we've got, um, as I said, we've got a software product that if you, you know, would, would love to sell you, um, I don't want to talk too much about it, um, but we've also, um, over the years, have a lot of good content. So we have uh, uh, two books. Um, we have uh, a manifesto uh, that has 18 points. Uh, we have this kind of three-hour training program and, and all sorts of content about data ops because it's our sort of mission to bring these ideas to uh, to, to the world and, and make it happen. And uh, that's really it for my, my presentation. Right. Good one, yep. really good one. Uh, actually, one of the slides reminded me something I, I read in uh, DevOps Handbook uh, when they told that experimenting is very good field when we can uh, we, we can be happy uh, to find errors because we make the system more reliable once we find find them because most of, most of the errors we we just don't know that they exist so. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have these phrases I've been saying for years. One of my favorite phrases is love your errors. And wh why would you want to love them, right? Because if you love them, it's an opportunity for you to automate them and make sure that they never happen again. And what I found is what I hate when I ran data and analytic systems is a thought that my customer could find a problem in what I, what I do. And I often felt like, oh, they're going to think I'm a moron. And what I've, what I've learned is to do is say, well, that's a problem. Thank you for sharing that with me. Let me find out what that is. Because it could not be, it could be in the raw data, it could be in the server, the code, stuff you did, stuff, stuff someone else did. You just don't know. And I think the best thing is, yeah, you found a problem. We found the reason and we're putting in an automated test so it never happens again. And I, I've never found a customer who doesn't love that. <laughs> um, and and what happens is you build up these tests and automations. You love your errors. And it's also, um, I found that a lot of organizations operate on shame and blame. So when things go wrong, they start to say it's someone's fault. And then people don't want to love their errors. And so um, what something I did is that, like a very simple process was um, that I, I recommend everyone do is if you're having a lot of production problems, to make a spreadsheet. And every time you have a production problem, make one entry in the spreadsheet. And then every month, sit down, look at that and try and understand the root cause and group the things in the spreadsheet and put in one check automation to make sure that that never happens again. And that process of reviewing your errors, fixing them um, can help relieve people of that sort of shame and blame culture and and so yeah loving your errors is is like really i think um a, a very important part and because um if you don't then you end up like i did you just sort of hate hate your life you hate going into work um you start blaming your other people and it just it's not a good way to work um and so i think it's it, these agile ideas also um end up you, you do more and your life is more pleasant as, as, as an employee and as a manager, it's a set of tools that allow you to handle these complicated systems.